This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you want to pre-order Wilds of Eldraine, you can use my link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and in this video I'm continuing my Wilds of Eldraine set review. So far I've looked at all the multicolored and colorless cards. Now we're taking a look at white. For each of these cards, I'll discuss how good I think they'll play in limited and I'll sum up my thoughts by using a letter grade. If you're new to my set reviews, you can find out what my grades mean by looking in the description. A couple of things to keep in mind as we look at these cards. First, I'm evaluating these for play in limited and not other formats. That means only cards that appear in draft boosters are in this video. Second, these are my evaluations of these cards before playing the new format, but I'll be providing updates about the format here on the channel as we go forward. Lastly, I want to let you know that I'm offering some set review related perks for both patrons and channel members. You get access to my ongoing notes during preview season, and by the end of the set review you'll have a spreadsheet with all of my grades. If those perks sound interesting to you and you want to support the channel, you can find ways to become a channel member or a patron in the description. Alright, without further ado, let's take a look at the first white card in my Wilds of Eldraine limited set review. And that first card is Archon of the Wild Rose, which for two generic and two white is a 4-4 Archon at rare. It's got flying. Other creatures you control that are enchanted by auras you control have base power and toughness 4-4 and have flying. A 4-mana four 4-4 four flyer is still a really impressive baseline these days, and this format has more than enough auras for the rest of the Archon's text to come up pretty often. In many white decks, that means the Archon will immediately impact the board by buffing a smaller creature and sending it into the air, and that will usually mean it can attack the turn you play your Archon. It won't always line up that way, but I think it will happen often enough with all the aura tokens in this set for this to be a bomb. I'm giving it an A-. Next up, it's Archon's Glory, which for one white is a common instant with Bargain, which means you can sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or token as you cast it. Target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. If this spell was Bargain, that creature also gains Flying and Lifelink until end of turn. One mana for plus two, plus two generally makes for a decent trick that will allow a creature to win combat fairly often and at a pretty low cost. And the added Bargain upside here will come up sometimes. It sort of gives it a mode where you can send a creature in the air to do lethal, in addition to the fact that lifelink can just have a huge effect on races and things like that, I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Armory Mice, which for one generic into white is a 3-1 mouse at common. It has Celebration. It gets plus 0, plus 2 as long as two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn. This seems like a reasonable 2-drop. A 2-mana 3-1 is like a D-plus these days, and this will be a 3-3 three, three, a decent percentage of the time. I wouldn't always expect it to be, but I think it will be often enough for this to be a C. Next up, it's Besotted Knight, which for three generic and a white is a 3-3 human knight at common, and it has an adventure called Betrothed the Beast. It costs one white for a sorcery, and it creates a royal roll token attached to target creature you control. So we have two mechanics here that we haven't talked about yet in this particular video. First of all, let's talk about adventures. If a card has an adventure, it's basically a split card. You can choose to cast it as a spell or as a permanent. If you choose to cast the spell half first, in this case Betrothed the Beast, the card gets exiled and then you can cast it as a creature later in the game. You don't have to cast the adventure side before you can cast the creature, but usually that is the better thing to do just so you get full value out of your card. On top of that, we have these Royal Roll tokens and roll tokens in general, but the Royal Roll one is the most common white one. This is an aura token that gets attached to one of your creatures, and the text here tells you this particular one gives that creature plus one plus one and ward one. So neither side of this looks like a very good card, right? I mean, you don't want to play a hill giant and a card that makes an aura that gives sort of a meager boost certainly isn't good, but you have to remember this is both of these cards and you can get the full value out of each half of this. It's not quite a two for one. The best adventures are the ones that give you some two for one potential. We'll see some in this video and we'll see some throughout the week. This one doesn't quite get there, but I do think making a royal roll token has a lot of value in this format. There's a lot of synergy for doing it. For example, we already saw the Archon. So I think it's probably worth something like close to half a card. So you're still getting some serious value here. Neither side is efficient, but you do get both out of one card. And it's pretty hard for an adventure that does two pretty real things to be worse than a C+. Next up, it's Break the Spell, which for one white is a common instant. It says, destroy target enchantment. If a permanent you controlled or a token was destroyed this way, draw a card. This is probably something you can put in your main deck in this set. 
There are a lot of enchantments, including those roll tokens. Destroying those normally wouldn't be that good because, you know, they're tokens, but because this draws you a card when you do hit one, that makes the effect a lot better. The times where you hit a legitimate enchantment are gonna feel really strong too, and there are plenty of expendable enchantments around on your board that you might just be happy to destroy, especially because there are some synergies in the format for putting enchantments in the graveyard in the first place. So. In addition to the fact that it will often have targets against your opponent, it's also pretty good with the synergies that exist in white in this format. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Charmed Clothier, which for four generic and a white is a 3-3 fairy advisor at common. It has flying when it enters the battlefield. It creates a royal roll token attached to another target creature you control. A five mana 3-3 flyer is a bad rate. Getting a roll token does make a difference, and this card can also trigger all the cards with Celebration because it puts two things into play at once. So it does a couple of things that do make up for the bad stat line, but even with that in mind, I mean, a five mana 3-3 three, three flyer is like a D, and so I don't think this gets that much higher than a C. Next up, it's Cheeky House Mouse, which for one white mana is a 2-1 mouse at Uncommon. It has an adventure that's a sorcery that costs one white. It says target creature you control gets plus one plus one until end of turn. It can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater this turn. So this is a Savannah Lions with upside. I mean, a one mana two one that's vanilla and limited actually doesn't tend to be that good. It's not that much better than a one one in limited and they can quickly get outclassed. It's not like in Constructed where you can have a critical mass of amazing one drops that have two power and stuff like that. So that part of the card on its own is probably like a C minus. You add this adventure into the mix and obviously it gets a lot better. It's not the kind of adventure that's going to give you a card worth of value though either because it's a sorcery. If it was an instant, we'd be talking about a really, really good card here because it would give you that two for one potential. But as it is, it mostly just buffs your creature, makes it harder to block and That's nice value to add to this and you can look at it when it's this cheap. You can look at this as a two mana two one that has this enter the battlefield ability. And once you start thinking about it that way, it looks a lot more attractive. And it's a pretty good card. It's just not insane or really impressive, but I don't really see anyone ever cutting this from like a white aggressive deck. I'm giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Cooped Up, which for one generic and a white is a common enchantment aura with enchant creature. Enchanted creature can't attack or block, and you can pay two generic and a white to exile the enchanted creature. Pacifism does not seem at its best in this format. There will be main deck ways to destroy enchantments, for one thing, we already saw one of them. For another, all of the adventure creatures feel pretty bad when you use up a whole card on them to remove them because your opponent will already have gotten some value out of them in the first place. Then there's the usual downside pacifism effects have in every format, and that is that it doesn't stop static abilities, doesn't stop activated abilities, and these things are becoming more and more common. It's also generally not good against cards with Enter the Battlefield abilities for the same reason they aren't good against adventures. So, as time has gone on, pacifism effects have become weaker and weaker and limited. And even though this is one with upside, upside that lets you eventually exile the creature, and that does matter a little bit because not only does it let you permanently rid yourself of the thing, so it does eventually fully remove something, it's just very slow and clunky at doing it, but it also matters because that means cooped up goes into your graveyard and that will trigger some of your cards, especially in black-white. All of that said though, this is just a solid card these days. I think it's just a C. Next up, it's Cursed Courtier, which for two generic into white is a 3-3 human noble at Uncommon. It has lifelink, and when it enters the battlefield, you create a cursed roll token attached to it. This is the only roll that is a negative effect. It makes the card into a 1-1. One, one. This has a really cool design. It's basically a three mana 1-1 one, one with lifelink when it comes down, and that is bad. But if your deck has enough ways to put other rolls on the courtier, because part of the roll effect is that each creature can only have one. So if you put a new roll on Cursed Courtier, it's going to lose the one it had and then get a buff on top of everything and suddenly be a really big lifelinker. You can, of course, also sacrifice it to cards with Bargain. This also triggers cards with Celebration. So you can see these various things that Cursed Courtier can do with the synergy in the format. So, you know, at first it looks like a pretty bad card because it has a downside and it's really not that efficient to begin with, but that downside is going to be upside a lot of the time. Now, it's not going to be so often that you can just count on this being amazing. Like this as a late game top deck is pretty bad because you're not really gonna have the ability to make sure you can get rid of this thing. I mean, it can block and gain you a life, I guess, but it does have its limitations because it does come into play as such a mediocre thing but it will be easy enough to make it into an effective creature that I think it's a C plus. 
Next up, it's Discerning Financier, which for two generic and a white is a 2-3 human noble at Uncommon. At the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, create a treasure token, and you can pay two generic and a white and choose another player. That player gains control of target treasure you control. You draw a card. This looks pretty good to me. A 3-mana 2-3 isn't the best starting point, but it could be worse. And the fact that this can just churn out treasure tokens is a big deal. It is sort of insurance against missing a land drop. And if your opponent goes before you, the financier is just going to trigger on the first couple turns it's in play. And, you know, you can look at that as netting you a couple of mana, gives you fixing. And then the fact that in the later part of the game, when you don't really need treasure and your opponent probably doesn't either, you can just take treasure and throw it at your opponent in exchange for cards... That seems pretty good to me. I will say there are going to be times where this does just feel like a vanilla creature. Like, you know, if you play it when you're on the play and you play this on turn three, it may never trigger, at least not while it matters. But at least you can always do something with the treasure and its ability to keep you from falling too behind on mana is a pretty attractive thing, giving it a B-. minus. Next up, it's Dutiful Griffin, which for three generic and two white is a 4-4 Griffin at Uncommon. It has flying, and you can pay two generic and a white and sacrifice two enchantments to return it from your graveyard to your hand. A five mana 4-4 Flyer is pretty nice, though it isn't quite as impressive as it once was. A creature this beefy that can come back from the graveyard is nice, but I do think sacrificing two enchantments is a pretty real cost, even with roll tokens around. It does get a little more interesting if you also have some payoffs for putting enchantments in your graveyard because it will trigger those too. But I think there are a lot of games where you don't have the time or resources to bring this back. And it's just going to feel like a five mana 4-4 flyer a lot of the time, which is a nice card, but nothing amazing these days. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Eerie Interference, which for two generic and a white is an uncommon instant. It says prevent all damage that would be dealt to you and creatures you control this turn by creatures. Fog effects are almost always bad and limited, even when they're one-sided. The problem is that they have far too narrow of a use case. I know someone watching this video right now already went to the comments to write about the time where their opponent attacked with everything, and they used a fog, and then they went on a backswing. But the problem is... That's pretty much the only situation where a fog sets up nicely, and that doesn't come up very often. This one does have the upside of sort of being a combat trick because it can allow your creatures to survive blocking your opponent's stuff, but your creatures already have to be large enough for that to really matter. So it really demands you have a board state to ever be useful, a significant board state for the most part, or it's just a regular fog, and, and neither of those modes is very good. We've basically never seen one of these pan out in limited, and I think this one's an F. Next up, it's Expel the Interlopers, which for three generic and two white is a rare sorcery. It says choose a number between zero and 10, destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. This is really good. Wraths can be awkward and limited sometimes, because if you're the beatdown, they don't really do anything. But when a wrath becomes more customizable, things get a lot better, and this one definitely is. In an ideal situation, you have a couple of small creatures that can survive you choosing one while killing everything else. It won't always line up that way, as sometimes your opponent has small stuff too, but Expel does make it possible for you to make this feel more one-sided, and that makes it quite powerful because it still effectively has the usual wrath upside of just nuking the whole board. I think this is an A. Next up, it's Frostbridge Guard, which for one generic and a white is a 2-2 elemental soldier at common. You can pay two generic and a white and tap it to tap target creature. This has medium stats these days, and it has an ability that is useful, but also pretty overcosted. Tapping things does bring some extra value in this format, but three for the effect is pretty brutal. I miss the days of Master Decoy. I'm giving this a D plus. It's just been so long since we saw a creature that had a tap effect this expensive actually pan out, and a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two these days just isn't that impressive. Next up, it's Gallant Pie Wielder, which for 2 generic into white is a 2-3 Dwarf Knight at Uncommon. It's got First Strike, and it has Celebration, and it has Double Strike as long as two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn. A 3-mana 2-3 with First Strike is already a really nice card, especially in a set with a lot of auras, and this will have Double Strike sometimes. Celebrating is pretty doable. We've already seen a few cards that can do it all on its own, but also you shouldn't expect it to just happen every single turn, but that's okay because the baseline here is really good, and when he does get Celebration going, he's a huge problem. I'm giving him a B-. Next up, it's Glass Casket, which for one generic and a white is an uncommon artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you exile target creature and opponent controls with mana value three or less until Glass Casket leaves the battlefield. This was in Eldraine last time, and it was a card that just barely reached premium removal status. It can deal with lots of things efficiently, and the fact that exiles is 
good news. Your opponent can, of course, get it back if they ever blow it up, and that happens sometimes, but you're still trading one for one, and you usually get some tempo in the process, so it's generally worth the risk, giving this a B-. minus. Next up, it's Hopeful Vigil, which for one generic and a white is a common enchantment. It makes a 2-2 white knight creature token with vigilance when it enters the battlefield. When it's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you scry two, and you can pay two generic and a white and sacrifice it. So the idea here is that you get a reasonable body up front, and then you can sacrifice this to bargain or to the griffin we saw earlier to help bring it back. That is very doable, and the fact that you get a decent creature up front really makes this intriguing as far as two drops go. It also happens to be another card that will trigger Celebration all on its own. I think this ends up feeling like a two-mana 2-2 two -two with a lot of good format synergy, and I think that makes it a C+. Next up, it's Kellan's Light Blades, which for one generic and a white is a common instant. It has Bargain. It does three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. If the spell was bargained, destroy that creature instead. This kind of removal is never amazing, since it's so restrictive. For example, if you're aggressive, something that can only target an attacker or blocker is a lot worse, and that's going to be true here. And this has the additional restriction when you don't bargain it of not being able to kill things that have more than three toughness. The bargain upside is nice, and it makes it a lot less restrictive, but it can still only kill attackers or blockers. So it's not premium removal because of those restrictions, and it's really not even a card you're gonna wanna play if you're an aggressive white deck. But if you're a more controlling white deck, this is a card that you're going to feel pretty good about having one or two of, giving it a C+. Next up, it's Knight of Doves, which for two generic into white is a 1-3 human knight at uncommon. Whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you create a 1-1 white bird creature token with flying. White has a lot of expendable enchantments in the form of roll tokens, but, you know, also the card we just saw. And Black White in particular is interested in getting enchantments into the graveyard and getting value out of that. So getting a few tokens out of this isn't far-fetched, and even just getting one is going to feel pretty good for your investment. I will say, though, that doesn't mean this is automatic. I don't think most white decks are just going to be able to jam Knight of Doves into the deck and be able to consistently make enough 1-1 flyers. I think there's a build-around element here. I mean, most white decks will have enough that he's not unplayable, but he's probably like a D if your deck only has, you know, two to four ways of making enchantments or having enchantments go to the graveyard. But if you really get there on roll tokens, on sacrifice effects, things like that, that's when things start to get really interesting. And he certainly becomes an engine when you can do that and probably one of the better cards in your deck. So I think he's like a B minus if you get there on building around him. Next up, it's Moment of Valor, which for two generic and a white is a common instant. It says, choose one. Untap target creature, gets plus one, plus zero, and gains indestructible until end of turn. Destroy target creature with power four or greater. Neither of these modes is very good on its own and probably wouldn't be a card that would make the cut. It's just too expensive for a trick like this. Sure, it can save your creature from dying to removal. It can also help your creature win combat, but you're just paying too much for the effect at this point. And that's true of the additional effect here that can only kill large creatures. Individually, both of these would probably be about a D. You staple two Ds together, though, and you end up with a C-. I mean, the modality makes it so you can actually play this card. Next up, it's Moonshaker Cavalry, which for five generic and three white is a 6-6 six, six Spirit Knight at Mythic Rare. It has flying, and when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain flying and get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. This white Craterhoof Behemoth is pretty interesting. It costs a ton of mana, but it does do something that will win you the game in most cases. You do need some board state, but even like three other creatures is going to help you do lethal when you cast this. But the mana cost is still so huge that this is the kind of card to be skeptical about going into basically any format. Eight mana cards just don't work out in most formats, and there are green decks in this format that I think will be able to ramp, but they're going to be the red green deck and the blue green decks, and then the Moonshaker Cavalry costs triple white, so it's not the kind of thing you can even splash in that kind of deck very effectively. This card is going to be sort of an interesting litmus test of the format, because if the format is fast, this will probably be close to unplayable, because eight drops just are. If the format is slow, it'll probably be a bomb. Most likely, it's somewhere in the middle where, yeah, having this in your deck is nice because it can win you the game from a multitude of different situations, but a lot of games just don't reach the point when you get to eight mana. But in the end, I think we give this a C plus. Like I said, it could vary wildly in one direction or the other, really depending on how the format turns out. Next up, it's Plunge into Winter, which for one generic and a white is a common instant. It says tap up to one target creature, scry one, then draw a card. 
I think you end up with a decent rate when you cast this, one that means you won't ever really feel bad about playing this. Tapping doesn't always matter, but you do always get scry one and draw a card, and when tapping does matter, or even better, when you have a tap payoff in play, this does get significantly better. Still, I think it's probably just a C-. Next up, it's the Princess Takes Flight, which for two generic and a white is an uncommon enchantment saga. It's got three chapters. When a saga enters the battlefield, it does so with a lore counter and you get chapter one. Then on the next two subsequent turns, in this case, after your draw step, you put another lore counter on it and get the next chapter. Then you sacrifice it after the third chapter. Chapter one here exiles up to one target creature. Chapter two gives a creature you control plus two plus two and flying until end of turn. And chapter three returns the exiled card to the battlefield under its owner's control. Temporarily exiling something with chapter one can be used to get an opposing creature out of the way for a little while, and it can also be a slow way to blink something, but the fact that chapter one and three are basically part of the same effect means the value that this can generate is pretty low. Chapter two isn't bad, but I think the whole package here is pretty medium. The best way to use this is to cast something with bargain after chapter two, that way you permanently remove one of your opponent's creatures. While you can make that happen, I don't think it's going to be so automatic that you can look at this card as being, you know, a three mana Oblivion Ring, better than Oblivion Ring, that then also buffs your creatures. It's gonna feel that way sometimes and that's gonna be awesome, but the baseline of the card is bad enough that I don't think I can give it more than a C. Next up, it's Protective Parents, which for two generic and a white is a 3-2 human peasant at common. When it dies, you create a young hero role token attached up to one target creature you control. This is the first time we've seen this particular role token. This one makes it so when a creature that has three or less toughness attacks, it gets a plus one plus one counter on it. This has below rate stats, but the death trigger is a pretty good one. You're not always going to have a great creature to put it on, but most of the time you'll have something that can gain like two counters from it. It is a little bit of a bummer. It doesn't buff your creature right away like the other rolls do because those actually can alter the way you're able to block and stuff immediately. And this one doesn't. It's gonna you know, take a turn before it really starts to make a difference. And it's more aggressive, I guess, than the others too. But still, I think you get enough value out of this card for the mana you spend that it's perfectly solid, giving it a C. Next up, it's Regal Bunnycorn, which for one generic and a white is a star star rabbit unicorn at rare. Its power and toughness are each equal to the number of non-land permanents you control. This will be a very large two mana creature on a lot of boards, and it has a floor as a two mana one one. This format looks to have more permanence in it than normal too, with food, roll tokens, treasure, rat tokens, they're all over the place. All that said, this does still ask you to have a significant board in place or it's really not very impressive, and the absolute ceiling is still just a big vanilla creature. I'm giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Return Triumphant, which for one generic and a white is a common sorcery. It says return target creature with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Create a young hero roll token attached to it. This is a lot like Recommission from the Brothers War. That card ended up being fine, but nothing special. Both let you reanimate a mana value three or less thing and buff it when you do. The idea is that you increase your chances of reanimating something that is worth this amount of mana thanks to the buff, but the card still requires setup. It's not very good in the early game and those are problems. It does get celebration going all on its own, but I think it's a C minus. Next up, it's Rhyme for Reindeer, which for three generic and a white is a three, four elk at common. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, tap target creature and opponent controls. This has some big potential as tapping down just one thing a turn is often pretty great at allowing your aggressive deck to really rumble. And that's especially true if the enchantment augmented one of your creatures. And in this format, that's kind of the most likely outcome. I think this will be easy enough to trigger that it looks like a pretty good common. If you aren't triggering it regularly, it is a below rate creature. But the nice thing about this kind of effect, these sort of tap effects, is it can really make a difference even if you only trigger it once because it really opens the floodgates on your opponent when you get their best blocker out of the way. So overall, I like the look of this, especially in like aggressive decks with a lot of roll tokens. I'm giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Savior of the Sleeping, which for two generic and a white is a 2-3 human knight at common. It has Vigilance, and whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you put a plus and plus one counter on it. As we've seen, there are a decent number of ways to get enchantments in the graveyard, so it isn't unreasonable to think this will gain some counters, but I'm not sure it will be so easy to grow that it's any better than a C. Next up, it's Slumbering Keep Guard, which for one white mana is a 1-1 human knight at common. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you scry one, and you can pay two generic and a white, and it gets plus one plus one until end of turn for each enchantment you control. It's kind of nice that this is a one drop that can threaten to get large late, as that means it maintains some relevance all game long. The ability is expensive, and even in a format with this many enchantments, I'm not ultra confident that you'll be able to buff this enough 
to really make the activated ability worth it. The incidental scry is nice to have, but I do feel overall like this might be a one drop that really underwhelms. It does do things, but the things it does are so reliant on enchantments and not actually that powerful. I'm giving it a C minus. Next up, it's Solitary Sanctuary, which for two generic into white is an uncommon enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. Whenever you tap an untapped creature and opponent controls, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Three mana for a stun counter and a plus one plus one counter all on its own. It wouldn't be a card that's playable, but it would be kind of close. And the fact this adds a counter to every tap effect makes it intriguing. It probably needs a build around grade though, as your typical white deck just won't be tapping things enough to really make this do its thing. This will really be at home in the blue white deck, which is the deck that's supposed to be about tapping things. I am overall kind of skeptical of how well that deck will work out just because it's such a strange theme to have. And a lot of the tap down cards just don't seem that powerful to begin with. So you're really gonna need to have payoffs like this to make them worth it. So I think this is probably a D in your typical white deck. Like you're gonna have enough other tap effects, one or two in addition to this, that it won't be unplayable. And if you really get there on tap effects, I think it's probably a C plus. Next up, it's Spellbook Vendor, which for one generic and a white is a 2-2 human peasant at rare. It has Vigilance. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may pay one generic. When you do, create a sorcerer roll token attached to target creature you control. This roll token gives a creature plus one plus one, and whenever this creature attacks, scry one. This is a bomb. Basically, this is going to play a whole lot like Luminarch Aspirant. Sure, you can't stack rolls on a single creature, so it isn't like this will always be able to buff your board, especially because it also costs one mana to do its thing. But that's okay because once it's already put the roll counter on each of your creatures, you're probably going to have an insurmountable advantage anyway. It isn't hard for you to make sure you get some permanent value out of this either, as if you wait until turn three and then play it and put the aura on something you've already gotten there, it can put the aura on itself too. That's a little more dangerous in terms of generating like permanent, more permanent value in the game because a removal spell still gets rid of the vendor entirely, but it can do it, and that's, you know, sort of the fail case here is a three mana, three, three with vigilance that whenever it attacks, scries one. And then the upside is something that buffs your board every single turn and really snowballs an advantage, giving it an A. Next up, it's Stockpiling Celebrant, which for two generic and a white is a 3-2 Dwarf Knight at common. When it enters the battlefield, you may return another target non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. If you do, scry two. So... This can be used to rebuy into the battlefield abilities and adventures, which is cool, but if it's not doing those things, well, you're playing a really inefficient creature, and there will still be a lot of situations where you just can't play this out and actually bounce something to your hand because the tempo you lose from doing that isn't worth it. You know, if you're in a really stable situation and you have something good you can return to your hand, then yeah, this will do some work, especially because the scry will improve your draws, but there's gonna be too many situations where it is just a three mana, three, two, so I think it's probably just a C minus. Next up, it's Stroke of Midnight, which for two generic into white is an uncommon instant. It says destroy target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a 1-1 white human creature token. We've seen cards like this a lot, and this kind of effect is generally worse than it looks. Destroying anything for three mana is nice and all, but in a lot of ways, this is kind of like an aura that makes a non-land permanent into a 1-1 with no abilities. Sure, that's removal, I guess, but it's removal that leaves your opponent something that they can still do something with. Even if that something is just chump blocking, you can already see how that's significantly worse than other removal that makes it so your opponent doesn't have anything that can block, for example. So leaving behind that kind of value isn't something that's amazing. This is still flexible enough and efficient enough that it's really good. I'm just saying it's not premium because it doesn't really take a full card away from your opponent basically ever, they're gonna get like a quarter of a card back every time you use this in the form of that token. I'm giving this a C plus. Next up, it's a Tale for the Ages, which for one generic into white is a rare enchantment. Enchanted creatures you control get plus two, plus two. Even with all the auras in this format, I have a pretty hard time getting behind a card that does nothing but buff enchanted creatures. This is because it doesn't do anything on its own, making for a pretty miserable fail case, one that is likely to come up pretty often even in an aura heavy set like this one, giving it a D. Next up, it's Three Blind Mice, which for two generic and a white is a rare enchantment saga. Chapter one creates a one one white mouse creature token. Chapter two and three create a token that's a copy of target token you control. And chapter four gives your whole board plus one plus one in vigilance until end of turn. This looks great. 
like most sagas, what you get up front isn't going to feel amazing. Your three mana one one isn't going to be something you're jumping for joy about. But then on your next couple of draw steps, you don't have to pay any mana and you get another one one and another one one and maybe something better if you have some other tokens. And then this card that helps you go wide buffs your whole board. And because you're not spending any mana to get those one ones on the second and third turn, that also means you're probably playing other creatures from your hand. And by the time chapter four fires off, you probably just win the game. You know, there is this horrible fail case where you're, you make the 1-1 one, one mouse, it's your only token and your opponent kills it. Like, that doesn't feel so good. But if they use a removal spell on that and then a couple turns later you get the chapter four, that's really not a bad fail case. No matter what, you're gonna get something out of this. And if your opponent can't interact with your token in any way, they're probably just going to lose. I think that makes it a bomb, giving it an A minus. Next up, it's Two and Veil Guide, which for three generic and a white is a 2-3 Fairy Scout at common. It has flying and it has celebration. It has plus one plus zero and lifelink, as long as two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn. This is pretty mediocre without celebration, but a 3-3 flying lifelinker is nice enough. As I've said, I, you know, triggering celebration is doable, but it's not going to be active every turn, so I think this is just a C. Next up, it's Unassuming Sage, which for one generic and a white is a 2-2 human peasant wizard at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you pay two generic if you want to, and if you do, it gets a sorcerer roll token attached to it. Neither of these modes is a model of efficiency, but the second mode does at least give you synergy for celebration and aura decks. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Virtue of Loyalty, which for three generic and two white is a mythic rare enchantment. At the beginning of your instep, put a plus and plus one counter on each creature you control, untap those creatures. It also comes with an adventure called Arden Vale Fealty, which creates a 2-2 White Knight creature token with Vigilance. This is amazing. On turn two, it cranks out a solid creature. And then when you cast the Virtue later, it'll make your board into an increasingly unbeatable thing. You do need to have something on your board, of course, but you're playing white. That's going to be the case most of the time. The fact that it untaps those creatures in addition to buffing them is no small thing either, as it makes it so your opponent really has no hope of beating you in a race. I think this is a bomb and a pretty massive one. I mean, you have a card that's a good two drop. I mean, good's an exaggeration, but a serviceable two drop at instant speed in the early game. And then in the later game, it becomes an enchantment that is unbeatable in all but like the worst situations for you. I think that makes it an A+. And our last white card is Were Fox Bodyguard, which for one generic and two white is a 2-2 Elf Fox Knight at rare. It has flash. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to one other target non-Fox creature until Were Fox Bodyguard leaves the battlefield. You can pay one generic and a white and sack it to gain two life. This is one of the cooler designs like in this whole set because it can either be a Banisher Priest or a Restoration Angel. What I mean by that is, you can use it to exile an opposing creature for as long as the bodyguard sticks around, which means you just played a three mana 2-2 two -two that's subtracted from your opponent's board. That's always great. But you can also use it to exile one of your own creatures. That's something you can do in response to removal or to rebuy and enter the battlefield ability. And then if you sacrifice the bodyguard, to gain two life, that thing will come back and you'll get that enter the battlefield ability or an aura will fall off of it or whatever. Most of the time, most of the time, you're just going to use this to remove an opposing creature. But the fact that it has this restoration angel upside where it lets you temporarily exile your own thing in response to removal, having both of those together is really cool overall. I don't quite think it's a bomb because it is such a reactive card in a lot of ways, but it's pretty darn good. I'm giving it a B plus. So those are all the white cards and wilds of Eldraine. Next, I'll take a look at all the blue cards. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of the set review, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on the videos that are already out, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting me and the channel, you can become a channel member or a patron. You can find ways to do those things in the description. Thanks for watching.